Okay, hey, welcome everybody. I am Joyce Barnathan, the president of the International Center for Journalists. And this is the first webinar we're hosting for journalists as part of ICFJ's new Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. We're grateful that you've signed up to be part of the forum and that you took the time to be here today. I know you're busy covering this pandemic, so I'm gonna dive right in. As we struggle to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic, what can journalists learn from Africa's experience containing the Ebola virus? The Ebola outbreak ended with more than 28,600 cases and 11,325 deaths, according to the World Health Organization. The media played a vital role in informing the public about Ebola and combating misinformation that sometimes spreads as fast as the disease. With us here today to discuss the topic is Dr. Samba So, who has a distinguished career in public health. Dr. So helped contain the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Today, he is one of just six special envoys on COVID-19 for the World Health Organization. He has been Director General of the internationally recognized Center for Vaccine Development, Mali, which resides within the Ministry of Health of Mali. Dr. So, thank you so much for being here today and addressing our reporters at this moment when the world seems to be in dire crisis. And just, and just a quick note for those on the webinar. Please submit your questions for Dr. So by typing them in the chat window here on Zoom, and we'll try to weave them in as best as we can in the short time we have. Those of you who sent in questions earlier, I have tried to include them in the questions that I've prepared for today. So Dr. So, the first thing I'd like to start out with was is that last night, um, President Trump indicated that he was leaning towards lifting some of the social distancing policies that are now in place in order to get the economy going again. And his quote was something like, the cure may be worse than the problem. What is your feeling about easing up on restrictions at this point? Thank you uh, for inviting me uh, uh, for this important uh, uh, conference. And uh, I really hope that uh, we will make this enjoyable and a good learning platform for all of us. Uh, regarding uh, the new decisions uh, last night in uh, the United States, I mean, it is what it is. Sometime people see things differently. Uh, uh, social distancing in, in places like USA will be so different uh, from places like Africa or even Europe just because of cultural differences, social behavioral differences. So I don't think that this will be like the number one top solution for things, but I do believe that you know, good hygiene and trying to avoid uh, uh, contacts as possible as we could. We are destroying uh, uh, social and families, etc. Would would be very helpful. So, as an African, I am not a big fan of social distancing. If if the social distancing is too big and too too strict, too rigorous. So it, it may not fly in, in a place like Africa uh, due to cultural, big cultural links and cultural way of doing things. Uh, we have some, some studies going on here, uh, you know, demographic uh, uh, surveillance, for example, you go into people's household and you start by not, be, the head of a household will, you know, wanna shake your hand and say hello to you. But in places like USA, you go into somebody's household, the first thing will not be to just point the hands out and say, I want to greet you by shaking your hand. So seeing differences like that, I think one could just be careful with what I said. I don't know if I answered um, uh, your question, but I want to hear what, what, if someone else is thinking about something else, I would be happy to, to hear that. 
Well, let's move on to the, the, the most important lessons you learned from the Ebola crisis that are applicable for the coronavirus outbreak. What, what were the things that you learned that you want journalists um, to know today that may be very, very useful? If I want to compare uh, or put them together, coronavirus, this current coronavirus 19, 19 pandemic with the Ebola outbreak, 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa mainly, I think the first difference is that uh, this one is much bigger and, and the geographic coverage is a way much bigger. And, and number two, this one started in, in you know, white Western wealthier, most wealthier population, like in Europe, in USA, in Asia, China is, is, is the origin. While the past Ebola in 2014 started in, in West Africa, in the most remote, rural, very difficult to access places. And, and uh, then the number of cases going up so quickly with this one compared to the Ebola. But one big difference with Ebola, between Ebola and this one is that Ebola kills so fast and so, so it's, it's, it's very much more severe disease, if I can say uh, somehow, because of the bleeding, because of the, the you know, the, the speed of the clinical evolution of Ebola. If when you see a real clinical Ebola case, once you see it, you will never forget. You don't need to go to medical school to, to get that. You just need to see it as a doctor or as a journalist or as just a, a human being. Once you see a case, it's done. You will never forget about it. So this is uh, Ebola. and and. The fear, the, the, the people were so scared about Ebola compared to this. It's so difficult for us. That's why you see country leads uh, showing every day on news, TV, etc., asking people to, you know, respect recommendation like social distancing, as you mentioned now. But I, I don't think the best way will be to to force people necessarily. Because if you force them to do something, they might hide it outside or different place, but they will still do it. In places like Africa, if you close borders, I mean, you're just closing what you want to do. You can close the airport, but the borders are still there and open. There is no, there is no border in, in places like African countries. So this is what happened in Ebola. And, and it was so big. It, it, this one is so big, but Ebola was so powerful, so dangerous, so fast killer, and so severe disease in places with very weak situation. But one thing that I also want to share has a difference. We have a proverb in, in Africa that we say, now the legs are tying the hands. Usually you use your hand to tie the legs. So now this is what is happening. This started in very, wealthy uh, developed places like Europe, like USA. And you can see how quickly this is showing that the healthcare system, the way Ebola showed clearly that we have very weak healthcare system in, in Africa, in the developing countries, the same, exact same way this is showing with the same magnitude and degree that the healthcare system, even in places like Europe, and, and, and Asia and US is still very, very limited. Well, two questions come to mind out of that. You rightly point out that the, the virus is now hitting mainly developed countries and it hasn't hit uh, weaker, weaker healthcare systems in Africa, say, yet. Um, what, where, where it's much more fragile than in the West, yes. what should, Africa be doing now um, to prepare? That is, that is a great question. Uh, as I said, the legs are tying the hands. So this started in the most developed places and now you see the evolution is going like backwards. So we will think that 
outbreaks like this with infection, infectious diseases will start always in the less developed settings. But this time it is the opposite direction. So what should we do now? We should do all we can for uh, transmitted, for contagious, you know, communicable diseases. All the first thing you try to do is how to break the chain, how to stop the transmission. So this should be our number one thing. And it's, it looks like with a disease like this and Ebola also, uh, we have to try to think the best way, taking into account all the socio-cultural behavior in, in our African community, the best way to stop this, to make our community believe and, and make them trust us and, and, and make them part of this to, to stop uh, the transmission of infection. So we so have to think about that. Does, what concretely does that mean? For me, that means, first of all, a lot of community information, sensitization and communication. So having platforms like this, you know, inform people who are uh, specialized in communicating with the right group. Yeah, uh, those people will take the key messages all the way down to the community level. So this is what WHO is trying to do. This is what the DG of WHO is trying to send out to sensitize country leaders, sensitize communication leaders so that they can take action, they can follow WHO recommendations in terms of stopping the transmissions, uh, improving by improving hygiene uh, status, by improving uh, 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 the healthcare system uh, 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 so that the healthcare system can function in a way it can capture uh, suspected cases and it can capture, it can do better testing and, and, and capture confirmed cases and, and proceed, you know, isolations, et cetera, et cetera, and care, you know, treatment of the potential cases early enough. Right. So okay. I must say this is, this is why the role of journalists are so important right now, because they are communications leaders who can do this kind of job very importantly in, dis in disseminating reliable information. <laughs> Yeah, we are counting on you to help us uh, do that. Um, in terms of testing, <clears throat> you know, some, some countries in Africa, I don't have to tell you, don't have any cases at all, including your own in Mali. <clears throat> um, is that an accurate look at the threat or has the disease been there and we're just not aware because there haven't been enough testing so people are a little bit complacent about the threat yeah you can call me samba allow me to call you joyce okay <laughs> this is a fantastic point um there are countries you're right there are countries where the detection rate for both you know syndromic detection suspect suspected cases and confirmed cases is going up it's, it's going very fast there are places where it's not moving we don't know what's happening in those places maybe in real life they have no real cases there we don't know why and maybe you know zero cases doesn't mean zero cases you know epi in epidemiology in a disease in situations like this, zero means a lot, and one means a lot. The minute you have one case, the country is red. So we don't know exactly, but I do believe that in, in some of the African settings where we have fewer cases, or probably where we still have not found a single case, uh, we should not be, we should be happy, but we shouldn't be totally happy. We should also worry. It doesn't, zero doesn't mean zero actually, maybe. Maybe it means zero. So what it tells me is that we need to focus on those countries to investigate and see if things are happening the way they are supposed to be. Things like detect detection of suspected cases. Are they following WHO recommendation? Definition, operational definition. Are they following WHO recommendation? Mm -hmm. Laboratory procedure are well following WHO recommendation on things like that. So we need to really carefully look at maybe the logistic 
uh, are not there. Maybe, maybe, maybe there should be a lot of maybes there. So I agree with you. This is to me a dark spot that we all need to communicate around and to talk to each other and, and, and change that. But there has to be some cases by now in mainly most of the countries. Let me ask you about treatment. Um, right now, some leaders here are talking about uh, oh gosh, I, I'm forgetting the name of it, Chlor chloroquine? Hydroxy, yeah, hydroxychloroquine. Chloroquine. Mm -hmm. And some people are saying that Africans have had a lot of, have used it to fight malaria, and that's why the incidence of the cases are lower. Is that just hogwash, or is that, is there something to that? You know, we just have to be very cautious with this result. Even this new trial just recently published, we have to uh, interpret and analyze and, and, and deal with data so carefully. So first of all, these are very preliminary phase one studies. And second, uh, it was done in a, under a crisis situation. So with small numbers, with limited, with a lot of unclear uh, 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 points. So having said that, uh, if the results we are seeing are just encouraging, it tells us that we can move forward and go for bigger sample size to be able to better conclude. But it doesn't say that in Africa, the reason we are not seeing more cases is because we have used so much chloroquine and we haven't used the actual hydroxychloroquine itself. We have used chloroquine. And this time they, there, are, there, there is a regimen with just chloroquine. There were regimens with also chloroquine plus azithromycin. So this was not used everywhere in Africa. And lastly, this medicine in Africa was used a long time ago. It was withdrawn from the market and from the African uh, malaria control programs a while ago. So after many years, why this drug will still be acting in our blood? <laughs> right. I, I think it's, there is a need to just interpret, to be careful and, 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 and not conclude too quickly. Right, that's a good, a good cautionary note. Given that um, Africa's population is much younger than Europe's, is the WHO expecting fewer critical patients needing intensive care? Uh, WHO it, uh, is advising, if you look at uh, one of the messages from the DG, calling African leaders to wake up, calling African countries to wake up, because WHO is advising, technical advising, advices to African countries and technical support, technical and scientific support. That's WHO's job to give us guidelines and recommendations. So WHO is actually recommending and, and uh, guiding African leaders to wake up and to be ready uh, for not only uh, the treatment, but for testing and then communicating in, the communi in our communities and also get ready for if they will have a bigger, a bigger number of cases. So we know that our healthcare system is weak, very weak. I don't know how many countries in sub-Saharan Africa will have, um, I don't know, maybe more than 50 or 100 beds with facilities for respiration, respiratory assistance, et cetera, et cetera. There is not, there is not a lot maybe few, very few. So we, this is the time for us to really get ready uh, according to WHO recommendation and try to have some facilities with, with a better care. Because what could happen is those countries you're mentioning with fewer cases or no cases, maybe there are already some community contamination going around. So the day we will start to detect cases, maybe they will detect actually bigger clusters of cases. And then immediately a week or two weeks later after detecting such a cluster, we will go into a, a, a real disease uh, case management. So that will, be, that will be much more difficult to deal with. 
What is the state of testing in Africa now? Do, do African countries have access to the tests? In the US, it's been a big issue because hospitals say they don't, they haven't to date had enough tests available. You know, this test is being done by, you know, a, 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 a molecular biology, it's a real time PCR machine that does it. I don't know in Sub Saharan Africa, South Africa, South African countries usually, in South Africa, it's good. Sometimes East Africa is also good. I know there are good laboratories in some of those East and South African countries, but the Sub Saharan Africa is kind of empty. I don't think if there are countries who will have laboratories with more than one good, well-maintained and GCP and DCLP, good laboratory practices, uh, procedures with a good maintenance and trained personnel to run uh, those PCR machines. So the diagnosis system platform in Sub-Saharan Africa, for me, is there, but it is still weak. For me, it is there, but it is still not enough to cover African needs. Maybe this is one of the reasons we are not seeing a lot of cases, a lot of confirmed cases in some of the places. But there are, it, it does exist, but it is still weak and it is still limited in most of the countries. Let me ask you a question that often comes up, which is about the weather. Um, if, whether the virus is sensitive to the heat because you're seeing a very high rate of transmission in, and death in, in the north. And in the global south, you're not seeing as many cases. Is, this, is there any relation at all to, to the weather and the heat? I would, I would say uh, that it is too early to conclude also on that. There are a lot of data collection and the research going on, but we found, you're right, we found more, more cases in cooler, you know, uh, less hot countries compared to hot countries, but it doesn't mean. People were saying three weeks ago, four weeks ago, that this will never come to Africa because it's too hot in Africa. So now, there you go. We're seeing cases in Senegal. We're seeing cases in Burkina Faso. These are very hot countries. We're seeing cases in, in Guinea, in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. So it's not then because of the sun. So it has been shown in some Chinese papers that this virus can stay alive outside for a long time, for actually a couple of days with lower temperature up to 20 degrees centigrade. But it's also been shown that it can stay outside in a place like Mali up to 30 plus degrees centigrade uh, for a couple of hours, just outside on surfaces, etc. So then, even if this has some relationship with weather, with climate, we know all flu will have some seasonal uh, pattern, but it doesn't mean that Africans should take that as you know, uh, a, a strong conclusion and say, we will not worry about this. This is a virus that can live in African body. It can live, the, the whole thing is when it enters to your body, does it live there when you are on the sun or when you are sitting inside in a cold room? There is no difference. It can kill you wherever you are. Yeah, well, that's a good cautionary note as well. We talked a little bit earlier about, um, about the social distancing policies. And I have a question from somebody who's on in the group asking about, does it make sense to close borders between African countries because of coronavirus? You, you see it happening in, in places in Europe. But my understanding from your earlier comment was, it's just impractical that you can't, there's no way to police the borders. Is that correct? Uh, thank you for this question, Doris. Um, this is one of the differences uh, when managing this coronavirus between Africa, you know, past Ebola outbreak and Africa today with coronavirus compared to Europe and US. If USA wanted, they can close USA borders. Even a fly will not be able to enter. I'm almost sure about that. If a country like France wants to close border, it will be almost possible. Uh, but if a country I like to say my country, for example, Mali, would like to close borders. During Ebola, when the president 
my president, President Ibrahim Bubakar Keita, a very good leader, uh, he called me, he says, Samba, I was told to close the borders with Guinea. First day was Guinea was a country in, in the most red position. So I told him, he said, what do you think? I trust you, just tell me as a technician what you think. I said, Mr. President, if you close the border with Guinea now, what's going to happen is that there is really no border, Mr. President. Because when you look at, you can close the airport, you can close the main road by car, but there are thousands of roads around the main road by land and by the river that you will never be able to close. So you will actually increase uh, the fact that people will find another way to enter and firmly and so that your healthcare system will not be able to capture. And then we will only capture those cases once they come into your community and hide and stay and develop and distribute the pathogen. He said, okay, because of that, I will not close the border. So there is no border. There are villages in Africa, half is, is in one country and the other half is in another country. Look at the two Congos. Look at in Mali, there are villages, half is Guinea, half is, 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 is Mali. There are villages, half is Burkina, and the other half is in Mali. How would you close that? So it's, it's impossible to close borders. What you can do, you can better manage them. You can collaborate and have villagers and community population to just be part of this. We created what we called uh, a brigade, you know, this is community leaders give us young people to go in rural roads and make sure that people can still come in. But when you have fever and symptoms, Ebola like, then we will stop you and, and do what we needed to do, follow country recommendation. So same thing should happen. If you see somebody with flu-like syndromes coming in, not a problem. Just make the doctors, make the healthcare team, healthcare system team knows about it and they can take, uh, they can follow the recommendation. That is the only way to, 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 to stop and to manage this thing. If you hide it, you close the border, people will still come in. Is that why um, the WHO advised against such restrictions, travel restrictions? I mean, WHO is advising against tra uh, for travel restrictions because um, uh, this is mainly because of the big airlines, big big uh, the, the travelers between, uh, for example, Asia to Africa or Europe to Africa, et cetera. But within Africa, WHO is always also asking to do that, but WHO is also saying to adapt the situation, to make it flexible, to adapt the situation to your, to your, uh, uh, to the condition, to the existing condition, wherever you are. So that's what WHO is recommending. And every country will have a WHO office and they are working together with ministers of health and government. And, and I think we should, we should go in an in a adaptive, much more practical, flexible way. In things like this, if a country doesn't work with communication team like yourself, if a country doesn't work with community leaders, if a country doesn't take into account socio-cultural behavior in a given community, you will fail. I think that's a huge point that the response to this is very local and very customized depending on where you are in the world. Exactly. Uh, let me ask you about Italy. As a, as a professional, what do you think Italy's main mistake was? Maybe um, mistake. I wouldn't call mistake probably maybe let's say maybe weakness or maybe unknown <laughs> that are maybe okay. becoming uh yeah so i would think that the main weak weaknesses or the uh the thing that they they missed some for some some reason is that uh, yeah, they, they they for me if you want to win a situation like this, you have to quickly be able to worry your population. I don't know if this English is correct. If I want you to follow some procedure, 
choice. I have to make sure you, I, you become worried first about it. And then once you start to worry, then you will take it seriously. So I think that's what happened in, in not only Italy, in Europe. People were not taking this seriously and people were kind of neglecting this. And a place like Italy is a place with a heavy uh, tourism uh, movement. So people were coming from Asia, etc., in and out. So there was no strong surveillance, early strong surveillance. And there was no early strong case management. There was not early strong community sensitization around this uh, to, to apply WHO recommendation. And for me, this could be one of the reasons Italy is becoming this because the transmission germ is still going around. So they have to stop it. That's where they need a heavy, strong uh, uh, social distancing and, and heavy, strong uh, uh, communication, information, and sensitization of people. To get back to my first question on the US, you, I, I, if I understood you correctly, Samba, you were saying that you thought that the social distancing policies were a bit strong. Um, is that your, is that your, you know, the, the population is worried, this for sure, we are worried. But um, the question is whether the, the remedies we're taking are, are harmful economically with forecasts of maybe 30% of the population going unemployed versus the real healthcare risk to people who are susceptible, especially the elderly. So I'm asking you, do you think that the US is on the right track or easing up is not a bad way to go? I mean, again, I don't know very well uh, the U.S. Uh, public health policy, but and and the U.S. U American uh, social uh, behavioral uh, attitude, and 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 uh, uh, and I think it is a little bit strong. I really think that it is a little bit too much, because when you make things so difficult and so rigorous what will happen is that people will try to find their own ways around, around your, your, your condition. So then they will hide to do things. They will have, everyone will try to have their own plan Bs. If you say you allow them only to go out if they have to go see a doctor or if they have to go to uh, uh, buy food, something like that, only that. So it's difficult to have people, a community, to lock them down in a house for days, for weeks. This is something that we are not, a US baby, is a US children are not used to be locked down in a house for days. So then it could bring over problem, it could bring over issues and people will try to find their plan B. So if you can make things flexible and adapt them and you know take into account community also needs and socio-cultural behaviors. So that will actually help you. The American community can help the government to improve the detection. They can help the government to better control this thing. But if you lock down everything, then communication will also be very difficult. Virtual communication can cover a certain number of the population, but virtual communication like internet, etc., cannot do everything you want it to do. Let me go back to Africa. During the Ebola crisis, Nigeria was singled out for handling the crisis particularly well. Is there any country in Africa now that's sort of leading the way in um, warning the public about the, the coronavirus and setting an example for the rest of the continent? Uh, there are a few countries really uh, trying to to stand out. Um, uh, one is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, South Africa, but the other one could be there, are, there is one or two countries in West Africa who are really doing, starting to do a better job. So one is uh, Senegal, I think. I saw some something on the news there. And, and uh, uh, now that Burkina is uh, seriously in serious uh, uh, situation with coronavirus because it started with the top higher level uh, population. So I'm sure Burkina also is trying to, 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 to do some better job, more communication. But in general, 
in Africa, I have to be very frank with you, very honest with you. The population is still not worried about this. And the country leaders are still not really seriously worried because there are, there are elections going on in some countries. So I can't get that. And some countries are still not gathering together all their potential, you know, their capacities together so that they can work as a team. Not a single minister can work on this. Not a single government can, can do this. Not a single community can do this. You have to put team together at the national scale. You have to consider every single level, not only scientists, not only politicians, not only communication. You have to put everyone together to be able to do that. And this is not happening in most of the countries. There are elections going on in most of the countries. And there are you know, still a lot of public events going around in a lot of the countries. So we need to really um, wake up and try to come together as a team. I have a question from somebody named Amelia who wants to know if funders want to help African countries prepare better for this, what do you recommend? Where should the money go and how should the money be spent? All right. Uh, when it comes to money, I'm always bad on that, but I will try to, to say what I, what I, 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 sh I, I lived in, in, during Ebola. I realized during Ebola that there are a lot of partners who, who will come in the country and say, we want to help. We have this and that. And most of the time, partner will have some specific domain, some specific field only where they can help. And they want to have their own specific way to to manage their fund in, in you know locally in that country so if you start to do that then the country leader will say okay this is your job so you may end up working separately so there is a big coordination issue when it comes to things like that in countries so i would think that whenever somebody is coming to help you have to work with local team it could be government it could be some other local NGOs, etc. So you have to involve always, uh, no matter what, you have to involve the local government so they know what is going on and they have to be part of this. And then when it comes to managing your own fund, you can set up whatever management system you like to set up to, you know, for transparency reasons, but you still have to let the government, the local government knows what is going on in that area. Uh, so I think if we need help today, the very first level for helping us is to improve the detection and the diagnosis. So meaning the surveillance, local surveillance. Our routine, existing routine surveillance today is so weak in many, many African countries. So if you wanna use that system to be able to control, detect uh, this coronavirus 19, you will fail. You have to set up a better, a much more improved surveillance system. Even if it doesn't cover bigger places, but you have to set it up. So you can have, start with a syndromic detection and then try to confirm some of those by having a, a better lab in a, in a referral center or in a research center in that country so that they can, they can do that. For you to do that, you also have to develop infection prevention control because you cannot ask people to go do surveillance, to go frontline, if they don't have the minimum supplies they needed to do. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about misinformation because sometimes bad information can cost lives. Um, what, I, and I recall during Ebola that there were all these rumors circulating that if you consume salt, you could keep the disease away and that, in some cases, more people died of salt intake than they did of the disease, I think, in Nigeria. So what advice do you have for citizens about where to get their information uh, in Africa? We hear a lot of things about Ebola. But this is, I'm happy you asked this question as a communication uh, specialist. I would think that this these rumors will go around and around. Even today, I hear some rumor that if you use uh, some traditional plants that you can kill 
Ebola virus. So by asking people to do that. And I saw some say yesterday, kind of prayers. If you do those prayers just in a water and you drink and then you, you wash with it, then normal, normal coronavirus. And these people, unfortunately, employees are the most powerful people in sub-Saharan Africa. If you bring down a professor like <sighs> Professor Karen Cutler, or you bring down the DG of WHO or the DG of Afro WHO, Dr. Tedros or Dr. Moiti in a village. So these people will come and explain WHO guidelines on how to protect, how to prevent, etc. And the traditional healer will come out then and say, forget about that, just do this, don't do this. People will listen to the traditional healer. That's where I'm saying communication is key. Communicate, it starts always with communication. It continues with communication and it ends with communication. That's number one. You have to do individual communication, not only community level, but you have to target those key individuals in a given community and talk to them individually, convince them and show them the truth and make them believe that they are part of this. That's one way. The second way is you have to try to identify the origin of those bad remorse if you can in a given community or at least the lead person who is, you know, taking over this bad remorse, if you can identify those or a group of people, then try to uh, uh, target those and, and, and talk to them specifically. That will help you to, to, to bring down the, 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 the bad remorse. We, we have a good example during Ebola. I, I went to see an imam and this person was telling me, I, I wouldn't say names, was telling me that there is no Ebola in his in his uh, in his family. That uh, you know they are fine. They only do try that they don't need. And he was saying that they actually bleach the water and the, the gel that we're using to clean our hands is where we have Ebola viruses. And then the next day, uh, two days later, his first son got sick and died. And then his first wife got sick and died. And then he got sick and he died. But before he died, I got a chance to talk to him. And he said to me that all I said to him before was true. So then uh, this was a good example for me to help with the rest of the community. So it showed me a lot of suspected cases and I communicated with the country government and then they, they, they were able to capture all the suspected cases. The transfer to the Ebola treatment center to treat them. So communication is key and take into account, you cannot control a big outbreak or pandemic like this in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. You have to involve social behavioral science people. You have to involve communication officer. We are doctor, we are not specialists in communication or social. Karen can treat, I can treat somebody, but we don't know how to better communicate. We need you all. And this is a good start in, 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 a, in a place like US or in like worldwide. Uh, I really, and thank you for organizing the platform. Sure, it seems like you, we need to target the influencers find the influencers and target them yes. in Africa because a lot of the influencers are really powerful either religious or political leaders. Yes, I agree with you. Um, I have a question from a journalist in, in uh, Bangladesh who is says that there are many outbreaks in uh, his or her country um, and uh, wants to know how to protect protect themselves uh, while they're covering them? Should they be wearing masks? What should journalists do to stay safe? I think uh, I used to have a lot of questions like this during a ball of a journalist. So make sure when you walk around in the community, high risk communities, you have to have the guidelines and follow the, your country guidelines. So if you are a journalist, you want to go to healthcare centers and talk to potential suspected cases, 
then you are highly exposed. So you have to just talk to the doctors and ask them, you know, what they will ask you to do and you follow that. So your number one protection, you are even starting to talk to a doctor, you should always have water and soap and wash your hands and reduce your direct individual contact with people, like shaking hands, like giving hugs, et cetera, et cetera. And don't touch all the places. We also in China and in Europe, in most of the places, they are spraying public places, you know, public transportation system, public places, because it appears, it seems like this virus can live for hours on surfaces just on surfaces, public surfaces. So when you are a reporter, you are a journalist going around. So I know journalists like to go around with microphones, with their cameras, they run around and touch every, so to try to avoid that and have always not only your gel, but also have water and soap whenever you can uh, to wash your hand. And for this, if you're talking to a very high risk uh, population, you should also try to cover uh, your face with a, with a mask, your nose and your mouth. That's very good advice. What about helping journalists find the right sources? There are some countries where journalists don't have good government sources or don't know who they are. What advice for you, do you have for them for covering this and finding the right healthcare experts? Uh, for me, if I, I, I am a journalist coming to a country, I will just do what Joyce is doing. Talk to your experts. Start with your, your friends, your colleagues, people that you know. And those guys will not lie to you. They'll take you to the right people. If you come to a country, if it's about a disease, I would first try to go wherever I am. I will look for the first officer. If it's about health, I will look for the first local health officer and then talk to that person. If it's about a whole government, national level, I'll try to reach out to the Minister of Health or to the Vice Minister of Health or to the National Director of Health in that country. I would avoid talking to just community like that. I would avoid talking to private sector like that. I would always try to find the most formal, the most official officer in that, in that area that so will protect yourself. Uh, just in case. And there are some countries in Africa where the population density is very, very high. Are you, do you have advice, especially for testing when the population uh, clusters are so tightly together that should be recognized here as opposed to sparsely populated countries? Yeah, I know there are places where the population, you know, the density is really high. And this is unfortunately the case in most of the uh, sub-Saharan African capital cities. Uh, we have really high dens and our, our public markets and our public, you know, some even some, some really much very populous villages. And that's how, that's why I was recommending to study uh, the socio-cultural behavior. Because if you go into those uh, crowded, population and you just want to separate people you want to say hey you have to be two meter from each other one meter from each other then you can bring serious problems instead of having uh the the positive effect impact you will you may end up having a negative impact so you have to find a way to communicate with those guys make them understand that if they get too close to each other explain the way they can transmit this, this pathogen among themselves. So it's all about education, information, sensitization. It is so difficult. Even if you ask those people to stay home locked, you may end up seeing 10, 20, 50 people in one little room or in one little compound, still crowded. So those guys will even be better outside than locking them down in their houses. That's why I said you have to be flexible. You have to consider the local situation. You have to see physically some of the situation for you to better understand and to study, to think with them the best way by respecting 
very, 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 very humanitarian and very, you know, you have to respect population. You, it's not about to put them in jail at their own houses. You can't, you can't do that in places like Africa. People will kill each other. It can, it can turn out really very, very badly. Right. Um, I have a, a medical question. Do you, can you get the coronavirus twice? <laughs> there are papers, I mean, not even papers, some discussion. There is no scientific proof. There are, seems to be cases in some of the countries like China where they think that people are getting it twice, but there is still no strong uh, 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 scientific proof that this you know, would happen. And we don't know scientifically for sure that if you have it once, that you will have enough, you mean your immune system will have enough protection so you will not have it twice. You know, we know that if you have flu once, if you're not vaccinated, sometimes even if you are vaccinated, these vaccines are not 100% uh, efficacy. So you can have it twice. Uh, but for these cases, we need time and we need more to study more. But there are hypotheses uh, that are saying that you can have it twice. Well, that's scary. And we don't have any idea about how long immunity will last if you, have immu if you are immune, is that correct? too early uh, to also say something in that WHO is uh, recommending to continue with more studies and bigger sample size, you know, zero, zero survey, immunological surveys and studies to be able to, to, to come up with final, some very strong final conclusion is too early. Do you think we should be mass testing throughout Africa now the way South Korea did? This way you can start to know more scientifically who's at risk and essentially isolate those mass, mass testing in countries like South Korea maybe can fit with what you know the you know the real life situation in South Korea but I don't think mass testing in Africa first of all how would you organize that at the operational level it will be very difficult very expensive and then second if you end up finding a lot of cases, uh, even healthy cases, healthy but careers, how would you handle with all that together? And, 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 and third, you have to have really a good quality, a better platform to be able to, to organize all that. So it's, it's going to be difficult. And what would be the communication around that? What would be the communication around that? So I would think that uh, in Africa, what we need is to strengthen the existing healthcare system so that if you are able to capture real suspected cases, most of them, I'm sure we cannot capture all of them. And those that we capture, if you are able to test them, wherever we can do the test, that will be nice. If we find confirmed cases and then we we'll follow WHO guidelines. And places where we cannot do the test because it's remote, because it's so weak, et cetera, at least try to set up a syndromic, syndromic surveillance, if possible, and try to quarantine those, those clinical cases, suspected cases, so that they will not, in case they, they happen to be real cases, they will not uh, contaminate uh, the rest of the community. So this will be uh, the priorities, easy, to go with a uh, suggestion that I'm, 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 I will make here. As a UN envoy, how are you spending your time now in dealing with the coronavirus? What are you particularly doing? So there will be a final terms of reference sent by WHO uh, very soon uh, on the role of an envoy, but uh, 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 this will be formally going out very soon. So. Right now, uh, you know, the key thing is to really uh, uh, try to uh, try to echo to work with the DG of WHO by trying to to echo um, the the key messages of of the Director General of of WHO. So our job is really to to whenever we can 
uh, uh, take part on different conferences with him and whenever we can to to take his messages his key messages uh, to the country leads and and to promote uh, uh, of it the provision of timely and reliable information about COVID-19 and ways to to minimize risks of infection based on evolving scientific information, amplifying our messages of, of WHO's um, DG and WHO guidelines on coronavirus-19 uh, with government, with all the partners through all appropriate uh, communication channels, like a platform like this. And we would like to, to utilize all those channels for communication with relevant uh, members of all governments, including uh, as appropriate head of states, and yeah, including uh, government members and, and, and partners to support outbreak uh, uh, and provide clear communication about risks and, and opportunities in, in compliance with international health regulation. So this is briefly uh, what a special envoy should do. So today, I, I, I haven't kind of formally, fully started this job yet because of many, many reasons. So one, one main reason is we are waiting to have our final formal terms of reference document signed off. And we are also waiting for our final appointment letter signed by the TG of WHO. But we are working virtually with the Afro uh, African region, for example, and with all the different regional WHO regional offices, uh, directors to try to be proactive and to participate into WHO conference calls and, and contribute uh, with ideas uh, to share with WHO and to share with countries. And, and we are also sometimes working with some colleagues in different countries asking us questions uh, and asking our opinions about some of the, the, the issues in their countries. Well, let us know if you would like ICFJ to have more, to, be, to return to our platform again, because we'd love to be able to reach as many journalists as possible with the valuable information that you and WHO officials may have. Yes, I tried to invite a WHO senior communication officer today in this call. Unfortunately, I sent him the invites very late, so, but he was so willing to join, uh, but that will be next time. I will be very happy, and I'm sure we'll get back to you to try to help us organize something like this, involving uh, not only African countries, but maybe African and around the world uh, countries also. And well, we maybe find, find a way to make it bilingual also or multilingual somehow, yeah. if you have that facility. We, we are doing um, some of the webinars right now in Spanish, but there's no reason why we can't do them in French as well. Exactly. exactly. So, let me thank you so much for your time, Dr. Samba. Yeah, We're really, really grateful to you for, for the work that you're doing and that you took time to talk to journalists who are covering the crisis. Thank you. I also want to thank the reporters for joining us, and I just want to tell you to stay tuned. We have a really strong lineup of health experts to speak with you. Tomorrow, I'll be interviewing a colleague of, of uh, Dr. Samba, Dr. Karen Kotloff. I will be there. Okay, great. Join us okay. the University of Maryland School of Medicine uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. She is particularly well versed in how uh, on issues relate, uh, relating to children and viruses, and she'll discuss how COVID-19 affects children. You can register for the event on our Facebook page, uh, on our Facebook forum, through our Facebook forum group. And please share the information about our forum with your colleagues, with journalists, and submit questions. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. So. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you very much. Stay safe and thank you to all the journalists for participating today. Will do. Thank you. And I'm sorry if uh, there are questions still not answered, but I will be happy to, to continue as needed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. Bye bye. You do the same. Bye.